Welcome. This video deals with the answer to question 5 of my second global warming quiz. This is about how we measure temperatures and how reliable are the results. Because if you can't rely on the data, you can't trust the conclusions. Let us first remind ourselves what the question was. Question 5. True or false? Poorly placed temperature monitors invalidate the global temperature measurements. It comes down to whom you can trust. The expert scientists who are just doing their jobs or those who are paid by the energy industry to create confusion and doubt. There are two factors we need to consider here. One, are the temperature measurements suspect? And how do the errors, if any, affect global results? There are many websites that purport to show that the US climate monitoring system is not getting reliable results. Let's take a look at some of the favourite sites and see how much of a problem there really is. Let's start with the one that I use as a backdrop to the quiz question. Yes, this one. Looks pretty bad, doesn't it? You have a large air conditioning unit close to a battered old weather station that is obviously in a state of disrepair. One wonders if the station is even being used anymore. How close really was it though? I note that both the AC unit and this station are in good focus, which means either the camera was set with a miraculously large depth of focus or the picture was taken from a long, long way away with a telephoto lens to make them appear closer together than they actually are. Putting that aside for now, let's look at how the heat would be transferred from the air conditioning unit to the temperature gauge. Here's a model of the situation. One weather station a few feet away from an air conditioning unit. There are many ways to transfer heat energy from one object to another. First there is conduction. But air is a poor conductor so we can forget that. How about convection? Nope, that does not work either, unless the unit is immediately below the thermometer, which it isn't. How about airflow? There's a fan in the air conditioning unit, but it blows the air upwards, not sideways, so that is out too. Our last chance is radiation. Here the distance becomes critical again, because the radiation falls off with the square of the distance. So, if you are standing 10 feet away from the air conditioning unit, you'll be receiving 1% of the heat that you would be if you're one foot distance. So radiation seems to be unlikely unless they are very much closer together than they seem. Here's one of my favourite examples which I debunked several years ago and note that some of the sites quietly removed it from their collection. This is Lovelock, Nevada. Again, it looks dreadful. The temperature monitor is close to a building with multiple wall-mounted air conditioning units pointed directly at it right next to a parking area for jet airplanes, no less. Could it get worse than that? Well, the answer is yes, it could. This is an example of a photo taken from a long way away to make things seem closer than they actually are. How do I know? I went to Google Earth and looked at the satellite photo. Here it is. You can see the building with the air conditioning units here. Here's the MiG jet. And here's the weather station. But what is the scale? Well, I found out that this type of MiG has a wingspan of over 35 feet. That means that the weather station is at least 50 feet away from the buildings, and not very close at all. So remember from our radiation example, that means that the thermometer in the station will be getting 1 hundredth of the emission that it would be if it was right next to it. In other words, a negligible amount, even if it were not shielded, which it is. Ah, but what about the fans in the air conditioning unit blowing hot air directly at the sensor? Well, let's model that. Here is the same setup as before so we can eliminate conduction, radiation and convection and just deal with the airflow issue. Let's consider a volume of hot air blown out of the air conditioning unit. As it is hotter than the surrounding air, it will span to become less dense. So it becomes buoyant and starts to rise. At the same time, it hits the ambient air and slows its forward motion as it accelerates upwards. So the trajectory is more like this. What about the jet? Well, it's a dummy. The real aircraft parking area is about 200 feet downwind from this sensor and so has no effect. So once again the measurements from this site are probably good. Let's do one more just for fun. This is Marysville, California, the fire station. Again an oft used example by the denialist camp. Here is the sensor just 10 feet away from a hefty air conditioning unit. Here's another view and another. Go on, take me back to that first picture. The AC units are around the corner from the monitor, so that does not work. Well, the next best shot is the barbecue unit. Uh, I assume that the firemen there 
keep that running all the time so they can show what a fire danger is. Perhaps drum up a little business when they haven't got much to do. You can, with a little detective work, do this for just about all of their examples. It is just so much rubbish. But let's assume it's not. So is there a way that the data can be used to weed out these rogue measurements? Let me show you one way that this can be done. There are tens of thousands of weather stations in several independent networks around the world. So how do the scientists combine the data from all these different places collected in different ways? First they divide the globe into 500 kilometers square grids, or an area about the size of Arkansas. Here are some of the stations in the Arkansas box. It's not all of them. You have no idea how boring it is putting little green squares on a yellow box in PowerPoint just to illustrate this point. So I gave up after a while. The red circle is a reference station and the blue triangles are NOAA automated weather stations. The little green squares are other monitoring sites such as amateur meteorologists, fire stations, scientific labs, universities, military facilities, all of which keep their own records. When the climatologists look at the data from each site, or rather their computers do, some sites will have anomalously high or low temperatures. These sites can be eliminated right away from the sample. Some sites will have incomplete or very noisy measurements. They can also be discarded. The remaining reliable data can then be regridded to isolate specific areas and then average and the formal uncertainty calculated based on the number of sites in the grid box and the diversity of their readings. Thus, if there are lots of samples in one area, for example a city, that will not count any more than a similar area with few stations like out in the country. The average temperature can be then calculated from that. They check the results by randomly selecting subsets of the data and redoing the analysis and comparing results. They could do this thousands of times. They can also choose different grid boxes and redo the whole thing many times. So there are huge checks and balances in, in the data analysis. But are you still worried about the data? Well, perhaps there are two other pieces of information that will assure you. First, we are measuring temperature differences in the study of global warming, not absolute temperatures. Why is that important? Because it makes many of these problems irrelevant. Consider two stations, A and B, that are close to each other and should get about the same reading. One is accurate, we don't need to know which, and the other is out by 3 degrees. In 1980, Station A measured the average temperature to be 23 degrees, while Station B measured it to be 20 degrees. 30 years passes and global temperatures rise by a degree and it affects both stations. Thus Station A will get the average temperature in 2010 to be 24 degrees, while Station B will get it to be 21 degrees, still 3 degrees different. The point here is that they will both be measuring an increase of 1 degree, despite the fact that their absolute temperatures are different. Second point. Noah took the stations that were classified as poorly placed by one of these prominent websites and did a temperature analysis using just them, and then compared that to the stations that were classified as good. They even invited the denialists who owned the website to participate in the analysis and make sure the weathers were open and above board. They refused. Why? Probably because they already knew what the answer would be. Yes, the two datasets gave the exact same result. So this whole thing is just another red herring in a veritable shoal of red herrings that the denialists use to confuse the public. The idea is to undermine the credibility of the scientists and their data by using cheap tricks. Don't be fooled by it. If you like this video, watch some of my other ones. The links to them are listed below in the description box. Keep safe. Bye for now.